U.S. relations with Russia seem to be getting frostier by the day, and in an unprecedented move, the Russian military says it now plans to send strategic bombers on regular patrol in America's backyard. David Martin is looking into this. Russian bomber patrols over the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico would be very significant, U.S. military officers say, something the Russians have never done before. During the Cold War, Soviet aircraft flew reconnaissance missions there, but never bombers capable of carrying nuclear weapons. Once in 2008 and again in 2013, blackjack bombers flew to Nicaragua and Venezuela, but those were window dressing for visits by high-level Russian delegations. When the Russian defense minister announced the bomber patrols earlier this week, he linked them specifically to tensions over Ukraine, in effect saying, if you meddle in our backyard, we'll meddle in yours. U.S. military officers say the patrols would not pose a military threat, since the bombers and their refueling tankers could be tracked as they came down through Greenland and Iceland and across the Atlantic, leaving plenty of time to scramble jet fighters. A real attack by Russian bombers would most likely come over the North Pole, the shortest distance between the two countries. After the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia stopped flying long-range bomber patrols and did not resume until 2007. Currently, they fly about 10 patrols a year off the U.S. coast, once coming within 50 miles of California. U.S. jets routinely intercept them. There's no law against it, so long as the bombers don't enter U.S. airspace. With President Obama and Russia's Putin attending the same summit in Australia this weekend, these new patrols are an in-your-face way of saying we're a global power and we're not going to let you push us around. We're going to breaking news now. These pictures are just in of President Barack Obama's car arriving in Brisbane ahead of the G20 Leaders Summit. Nicknamed the Beast, it's designed to withstand a rocket attack. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away with him. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy wood. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. From scripture we learn of the miracle of restoration. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. A top NATO commander says Russian tanks and troops are moving into eastern Ukraine. Moscow denies those claims. The development comes after Russia announced new Air Force training exercises near United States borders. David Martin is at the Pentagon with the military's response. David, good morning. Good morning. When Russia's defense minister announced plans for these new long-range bomber patrols, he linked them specifically to tensions over Ukraine, telling the U.S. in effect, if you meddle in our backyard, we'll meddle in yours. The announcement of the new patrols comes just as President Obama and Russia's Putin are set to attend the same summit this weekend in Australia. Both men surely know having bombers circle around to the south of the U.S. doesn't make much military sense. The bombers and their refueling tankers could be tracked all the way across the Atlantic leaving plenty of time to scramble interceptor jets. Benjamin Friedman is a research fellow at the Cato Institute. Politically, it's important. It shows that Russia is trying to sort of show its relevance and poke its finger in the U.S. eye and say, look, we're still here, we still matter, we're something you have to deal with and plan for. There's no indication yet when these new patrols would begin or how often they would be conducted. With dramatic pitches and steep banks, China shows off its next generation fighter plane. This is the J-31, a stealth fighter. It can come in, uh, as the U.S. has stealth fighters, stealth bombers, 
come in uh, in a full up radar environment and not be detected. Analysts say this jet could be designed for mid to low altitude attacks and may be deployed from an aircraft carrier. The J-31 looks stunningly like a late model American stealth fighter, the F-35. It's been pretty clear and I think the US government has been pretty clear in making its claims, which I have no reason to doubt, uh, that the Chi that Chinese hackers have been targeting defense contractors, uh, U.S. government facilities, and others. Several published reports say the Chinese got the blueprints for the F-35 through a cyber assault on a contractor for Lockheed Martin and built their fighter jet with the same specs. The Chinese have denied that. China tested the J-31 right as President Obama was in Beijing for the Asia-Pacific Summit. It comes on the heels of China christening its first aircraft carrier, sending ships to islands whose territory has long been disputed. Analysts say this isn't about confronting America militarily, but about reducing U.S. military influence in its neighborhood. What the Chinese military is trying to do is to be able to put their military out further from China, out into the Pacific, in the air, under the sea, and on the sea, in order to deter others from coming too close to China. It's also about prestige. It's also about the status of China. It's also about using platforms like aircraft carriers to perform what's called military operations other than war, humanitarian relief, uh, that kind of thing. The United States uses its aircraft carriers for that purpose quite a lot. China now flexing more military muscle. One of these two powers is gonna be so concerned someday with projection of power in the Pacific that it's gonna overreact in a crisis or that it might escalate what seems now to be an arms race. Lurking in the freezing waters off Sweden last month, a hidden danger. This was a major hunt launched by the Swedish Navy to find a suspected Russian submarine off their coast. The Swedes said they would force it to the surface if they could find it. They couldn't. But it's one of a growing number of potentially explosive incidents that one London-based think tank says is putting the Kremlin on a collision course with the West. Our report singles out 11 serious incidents. Uh, here we are talking uh, about the aircrafts flying really close uh, to each other. Uh, we are talking about uh, harassment of uh, warships. Uh, we are talking uh, about uh, simulated attacks conducted by the Russian fighters against targets in Sweden, Denmark and the United States. The report, called Dangerous Brinkmanship, says a mix of more aggressive Russian posturing and readiness of Western forces to show resolve is increasing the risk of escalation. As well as the 11 serious incidents, the report also details three high-risk ones, which in its view carried a high probability of causing casualties. One was the submarine search, another was a narrowly avoided collision between an SAS civilian airliner taking off from Copenhagen and a Russian reconnaissance plane. SAS have confirmed to CNN the incident took place last March. The third high-risk incident, says the report, was the abduction of an Estonian intelligence officer shortly after President Obama visited the country and NATO ally in September. Moscow says he was arrested for spying on Russian soil. Of course, even if such incident happens, uh, it doesn't lead automatically into a full-blown uh, war. Uh, the problem is that uh, we have less and less uh, direct contact between the militaries on the both sides. If we don't have this kind of established channels of communication, uh, even uh, one incident uh, can simply lead to uh, an escalation that neither of the sides really want. It may not be a new Cold War with Russia Russia, not yet. But the risk of miscalculation has echoes of that much more dangerous time. Russian forces on the move again into eastern Ukraine. Preparations, Ukrainian officials tell CNN, for a new offensive by pro-Russian separatists. We have seen columns of Russian equipment, uh, primarily Russian tanks, Russian artillery, uh, Russian air defense systems, and Russian combat troops uh, entering into Ukraine. And NATO says they've observed something even more alarming. Russian warplanes capable of carrying nuclear weapons deployed to Crimea. <laughs> Annexed by Russia illegally earlier this year, if confirmed, the step could violate multiple international treaties. 
we see uh, forces that are capable of being nuclear that are being moved to Crimea. Whether they are or not, we do not know, but they do have the kind of equipment there that could support that mission. Russia's foreign ministry immediately denied the claims, calling them, quote, unfounded. The new weapons, accompanied by renewed fierce fighting between Ukrainian forces and separatists, has all but ended a brief, shaky ceasefire. Expressing alarm in both public and private, Ukrainian officials say they are now preparing to fight. We expect unexpected actions from them. I see it as our main task to prepare for military action. Today at a UN Security Council session on the situation in Ukraine, Ambassador Samantha Power condemned Russia's actions. Russia has negotiated a peace plan and then systematically undermined it at every step. It talks of peace, but it keeps fueling war. As security is ramped up for the G20, defense chiefs are closely monitoring a convoy of Russian warships just outside Australian waters. The government says it has known about their movements for some time and admits it's unusual. A daisy chain of world leaders, arm in arm in Myanmar, a symbol of unity. But Tony Abbott at one end and Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev at the other a symbol of division as a group of Russian warships steams closer to Australia. Certainly it is unusual for uh, Russian naval elements to be in Australian waters. Um, unusual, not entirely unprecedented, but unusual. Defence sources say the four Russian ships led by the guided missile destroyer Varyag are moving south southeast, skirting Australian territorial waters. The frigates HMAS Stewart and HMAS Parramatta are flanking them, and P3 Orions are flying regular sorties from Townsville tracking their movements. That's what we do. Uh, when warships are approaching Australia, uh, we keep them well monitored. A Russian embassy spokesman said they would not enter Australian waters. We stick to the rules, nobody wants conflict. He described it as a routine exercise, but an admission. Your reaction is not that surprising because we do rarely go this way. Russia is entitled, as any other country is entitled, to traverse international waters. Is it a show of force or is it a significant country with a significant navy? I don't think we should play the Putin game of uh, engaging in his stunts. This naval display is obviously time for the weekend's G20. Tony Abbott says it would have been months in the planning. But the Kremlin's confirmed the flotilla left Vladivostok on October 23, 10 days after Tony Abbott threatened to shirt front Vladimir Putin. Let's not forget that Russia has been much more militarily assertive in recent times. Like sending nuclear submarines to Scandinavia, warships off Crimea, troops crossing into Ukraine, long-range bombers flying over Central America, and now its Pacific fleet skirting Australian waters. I think the rest of the world is watching closely what Russia does because there is an element of unpredictability about it. And this week, the world's watching the G20 in Brisbane. This is a rare view inside the fighting in eastern Ukraine. A gun battle at the airport in Donetsk. Then a rebel tank fires and destroys a Ukrainian military position. These are Ukrainian forces battling separatists armed and supported by Russia. And now more Russian heavy weapons are on the way. New images of Russian military vehicles and artillery rolling into Ukraine. Ukraine's president says his country has lost control of its eastern border. The Ukrainian-Russian border, under independent monitoring, is repeatedly crossed by the Russian regular forces. Now, those same Russian forces say NATO's supreme allied commander are firing at drones from the International Observer Mission. Reiterating Moscow's frequent denials, today the Russian foreign ministry spokesman said no Russian forces of any kind are in Ukraine. There are no military forces or any military movement across the border. And moreover, there is no presence of our troops in the territory of Ukraine. On the map, you can see how Russia has, in effect, now occupied territory inside eastern Ukraine. It's this area here that is under the control of pro-Russian separatists. Let me show you here, these are positions of we Russian weapon systems as identified by Ukrainian authorities. You can see missile launchers here, tank divisions, and then these 
Troop divisions along the border are what U.S. officials say are eight to 9,000 Russian troops positioned along the border. And that border here, the red area here, is in effect controlled by Russian authorities. And just to place it, uh, this here is where uh, U.S. officials say that Russian supplied missiles shot down the Malaysian airliner MH17. We begin with growing Russian military activities across the globe. Russia now says it plans to launch long-range bombers on regular patrols from the Arctic onto the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Moscow is also sending a convoy of warships towards Australia. The European leadership has detailed more than 40 major breaches by Russia in the past eight months. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin may have some explaining to do as he goes into the G20 summit in Australia. Needless to say, his interaction with other world leaders will be closely watched, as it was at this week's APEC gathering in Beijing. CCTV's Tom Barton reports. President Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin's public interactions display little warmth these days. Their awkward contact at APEC will be quickly followed up thanks to the G20. The build-up to the meeting has been stormy, with rumours and suggestions that Russia either shouldn't be allowed to go or might not turn up. I say with sadness that there's no purpose in being there. Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott, whose country is hosting the G20 meeting, has pulled back from his talk of shirt-fronting or knocking Putin to the ground, but has said he will have a robust conversation about what he calls the murder of 38 Australian citizens on board flight MH17, which Western governments accuse pro-Russia militants of shooting down in July. From Prime Minister Abbott to President Obama and others, diplomats and journalists will be watching intently for more signs of the chill that has come between Russia and the West. In March, Russia was thrown out of the G8 group of nations for annexing Crimea. But in Moscow, the position of Western powers is seen as counterproductive. I think that if the G8 or the G20 wants to work fully and have influence and have a wide ability to cover problems and solve problems, they need to have dealings with Russia. If these groups turn towards pressure, we're not interested in taking part. President Obama insists Russia has been supporting militants in eastern Ukraine and says it must stop. But President Putin shows little sign of wanting to acquiesce to the West or show weakness in the face of sanctions. Tom Barton, CCTV, Moscow. Well, this is about Russia's risky, calculated pattern of aggression toward the U.S. and its Western allies. There have been multiple incursions close to U.S. airspace this year. Recently, a Russian military plane came within 50 miles of the California coast. Some of these encounters have come within a razor's edge of causing serious casualties. A dangerous maneuver. A Russian jet fighter buzzes right in front of a U.S. Air Force surveillance plane within about 100 feet of the nodes, a move which U.S. officials said endangered the American crew. Another incident. A Russian military aircraft comes within 50 miles of the California coast, the closest in years. Get ready for more. Russia's defense minister says his military is about to send long-range bombers to patrol near American coastlines. You're going to have bombers coming in this direction from Russia. You're certainly going to have longer range bombers coming down this coast, almost certainly. And you're also going to have bombers coming down the, this coast. And he also mentioned in particular flying in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're talking about ringing the United States with the exception of the Canadian border. The Russian planes likely won't fly inside U.S. airspace within 14 miles of the coasts. But U.S. officials call the action provocative and destabilizing. Russia's defense minister says it's a response to aggression near its border with Ukraine. This is a rationalization by Russia, and in particular by President Putin, to strengthen his appeal with his, with his nationalist base. Russia's aggression playing out around the globe. A Scandinavian passenger jet nearly colliding with a Russian surveillance plane. One incident right out of a Tom Clancy novel. In waters near Stockholm, a mysterious underwater vessel makes an emergency call in Russian. It triggers the largest submarine hunt off Sweden since the Cold War. All these incidents have taken place since Russia invaded Crimea in February. More than 40 close military encounters in that period, according to one European report. Analysts say this is one man, Vladimir Putin, flexing his muscle, desperate to restore Russia's Cold War power. Putin is personifying as the tough guy, the image of Russia that he wants to present and those around him want to present now of a Russia that will not back down, of a Russia that will take on the West, and a fact of a Russia that will take on anybody. Take a look at these black dots that we're showing here. 
This report says 40 encounters between the Russians and other nations over the past eight months have rattled nerves and raised tensions to a Cold War level. You mentioned that close call that Jim mentioned as well between a passenger jet and a Russian jet along in here. But there are many others from the Russians. This report says they staged a simulated bombing attack on a Danish island. A Russian jet made threatening maneuvers toward a U.S. reconnaissance plane, including showing that it was fully armed with missiles. Russian planes have buzzed ships. And they even, out in this area, practiced a cruise missile strike within range of New York, Washington, and Chicago. Jake? And Tom, how, how close have any of these incidents been to the United States or American troops? Well, if you look up here on the northern part, you're near Alaska and Canada. In September, six Russian jets were spotted up in this area. Russia is suggesting it will have full radar surveillance of this area by year's end. That is not really that uncommon up there, but in June, Four Russian planes were coming down along the coast here within 200 miles. Two of them went all the way down here to within 50 miles of the coast of California. That's the closest they've been since the Cold War. They were intercepted by US F-15s. That's just short of US airspace. And such incursions are not unheard of, but they're becoming more common. And this was the closest one in about two years, Jake. Well, what kind of planes are we talking about? What kind of planes do the Russians even have in their arsenal for these types of flights? For some missions, Russia is using fighter jets along with refueling planes, as Jim just mentioned. But the big piece of equipment on the scene is this. It's the Tupolev 95, nicknamed the Bear by NATO. This plane grew out of the Cold War in the 1950s, way back then. It is a turboprop, so it looks antique compared to modern bombers like the Stealth, but it's a serious weapon. Just take a look at some of the things that it has going for it here. If you go into this plane, you have a maximum speed of almost 600 miles an hour. It has a range for missions of well over 5,000 miles. It can carry 11 tons of ordnance, including cruise missiles and nukes. And like U.S. long-range bombers, it is designed for big impact precision strikes. Of course, more Russian planes and ships could increase the chances of a potential run-in with our own military. What if there's a mistake? This week, a European watchdog group reported a dramatic rise of encounters between Russian forces and NATO forces. It reported dozens of incidents, three of which it claims carried a high probability of triggering a direct confrontation. One of them a reported near crash between a Russian spy plane and a passenger jet. So none of this is routine stuff. And Vladimir Putin is in uncharted territory. Jennifer Griffin's on Fox Top Story at the Pentagon this afternoon. It's one thing to flex your muscle, Jennifer. It's another to put, well, the whole world in jeopardy. That's right, Shep. And there was also that recent hunt for the suspected Russian submarine off the coast of Sweden that got the U.S. military's attention. Forty incidents involving the Russian military coming into near confrontation with NATO members since Putin's invasion of Crimea. The Pentagon reacted to the announcement from Russia's defense minister today that Russia now plans to extend its long-range bear bomber flights to the Caribbean. Spokesman Colonel Steve Warren downplayed the threat and simply said the Russians have patrolled in the Gulf of Mexico in the past, and we've seen the Russian Navy operate in the Gulf of Mexico. These are international waters. One obstacle for Russia is refueling. That's why Russia's military is in talks with Cuba and Venezuela for air basing rights. Pentagon officials don't see the move as a serious threat, but it is a reminder that Putin is trying to make his military more visible and more assertive. In fact, last September, Russian bear bombers, those strategic bombers that can carry nuclear weapons, reportedly practiced cruise missile strikes against the U.S. Shep. Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon. Jen, thanks so much. Let's get dig deeper on this. Foreign affairs columnist and author Gordon Chang is with us on the news deck. What's he doing? I think what he's trying to do is he's saying to the rest of the world, look, I can do whatever I want. The United States can't stop me. I've got a new friendship with the Chinese. They're going to finance what I'm doing. So I'm going to grab what I want. And that's clearly um, Georgia, Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine. You know, it's just, it's awful. But why does he, he's doing it because of his own economic situation? Well, I think so. Because last year, the Chinese, uh, the Russian economy grew 1.3%, which was below every estimate. This year, it's going to 0.5% growth. And that was before the recent plunge in oil prices, which is bringing oil prices to a three-year low. And Russia depends on selling hydrocarbons to Western Europe and now to the Chinese. So what advantage does it give him to take over other countries and fly his bombers 
in the, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, Putin has always said that he was going to reassemble parts of the Soviet Union that he felt were taken from Russia uh, unfairly at the end of the Cold War. So clearly right now he is going to do that while the United States is certainly distracted in a number of other areas and the Chinese are going to finance him because they have just signed up a major oil and gas deal. And this is going to be important for Putin because now he's going to have the money to fly those bombers in the Gulf of Mexico. This probably sounds very de deja vuish to some of our viewers because under Reagan it was so similar. It was similar and what Reagan did towards the end of the Cold War was to drive down the prices of commodities that that's Soviet what Union did sold. And that's what brought the Soviet Un Union to the end because they no longer had the money to support their military and to keep their people happy. What we're seeing right now is the same dynamic because the prices for Russian commodities are coming down but we're not intentionally doing it. If we were actually to start to push commodities down with the Saudis, this would bring Putin to the edge. But he still has the Chinese. Would that not be uh, uh, an affront to the Chinese if we were to do such a thing? Well, it certainly would because they both see themselves as on the same page. They see the United States as the common adversary. And that's why they're molding their militaries together. That's why the Russians are now selling frontline equipment to the Chinese. And that's why they're now cooperating in East Asia as well in other places. W what's going to happen, though, if there's a mistake? If there's an accident between one of these throwback bombers of the Russians and something we're flying around? Well, you know, we saw this during the Cold War when there were a number of near misses. And, you know, we were very fortunate to get through that. We got lucky. We got lucky. But the problem right now is that Putin thinks that he can use nuclear weapons not as instruments of deterrence, but as really weapons of aggression. Because at the end of August, he talked about using nukes to hold on to what he had grabbed in Ukraine. And so he learned a lesson. He got away with it, so he's going to try it again. And now the Chinese have seen, oh, you know, Putin can do it. Why can't we do it as well? And because we've heard Chinese threats to use nukes before, now they're going to become emboldened. Gordon Chang, it's nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.